Um, we're very lucky to, tonight to have Alison Woolard to kick off the event for us. Now, Alison Woolard is the academic champion for public engagement with research at the university, um, and she's uh, so they have a wide, overarching role over um, uh, uh, this kind of activity, and particularly the activity uh, which has been funded by the Wellcome Trust, which we're talking about tonight, which is one of a series of projects that Alice will talk about. Um, I'm also very lucky to have Alison as a colleague in my college at Hartford, and indeed some of you may remember that she was the Royal Institution uh, Christmas Lecture, which I think it was as long ago as in 2013. Is that right? So some people won't remember that. I certainly can. Um, when she did the series of lectures of Life is Fantastic. So Alison, thank you very much. Yeah, very much. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight and to, to, to start to kick off this launch. Um, and I thought it would just be useful to give a little bit of background about the Welcome Project that the university has um, been, been the lucky recipient of, which has enabled this project and other projects to um, happen. It's, um, things come up so uh, back in about 2019, Welcome uh, approached us. Are we okay? So um, <clears throat> Welcome Trust, who funds a lot of biomedical research uh, in the UK yeah. and beyond, um, came to approach the university in about 2019 because they wanted to pilot a new way of funding um, public engagement with research for their welcome funded research projects. So welcome for a long time have recognized that, um, <clears throat> that the best research is people centered. Um, it's very important for the public to see the value of research and that in seeing the value of research and being exposed to researchers, then that's very important for fostering trust in science. Um, but Welcome were wanting to get more applicants for their various um, public engagement funding streams, and they wanted to try to realize more value from these schemes um, by involving universities more directly. So we were the lucky recipients of one of their two pilots um, um, called the Welcome Institutional Research Engagement Fund, or IREF. And it's the biggest grant that's ever come into the University for Public Engagement at um, just less than £2 million, which might not sound a huge amount in research um, fund terms when we think about how, exper how, in how expensive research is to do. But in terms of public engagement with, res with research, it's, a, it's really quite a significant that's amount of money. And so when this money came into the university, um, our aims, of course, aligned with the, with the aims of the welcome in terms of um, trying to increase the quality of public engagement with research. And really, that's all about using the engagement as a way of feeding back into the, into the research. So trying to engage the public, collaborate, cooperate, and so on, where that's possible. And um, so part of this has been wraparound support for researchers. Um, so I hope that Martin's group would agree that they've had very good support during the application process for their funding and beyond. Um, that this scheme also aims to increase support and recognition for researchers as well as for public engagement professionals within the university and to build capacity in this area, which has been, I think, in terms of the outcomes for the university, building capacity strengthening links to research um, with, between individual researchers and the public, involving the local community and enhancing research culture in terms of this joined up um, culture of collaboration both across the university and between the university and wider society are all really, really important aims for the university, as well as for welcome, of course. Um, and I would also say that I've been on the panel now for, we've had four rounds of applications for this research and enrichment funding. It's called Enriching Engagement in Oxford. Um, and we've also had a, a round called the Embedding Round, which is for even larger awards. And it's been a huge joy. It's probably the most joyful um, grants panel I've ever been part of because everyone who applies for this funding is very passionate not just about their science, but about involving the whole of society with their science. And it's been a, an amazing journey for me to look, to, to get, I have a window on not just the amazing research that's going on in Oxford, but the energy and the innovation and the new ideas that researchers have to, um, it, to make their story part of everyone's story. Um, and that's been incredibly powerful. And I've learned so much in so many different areas 
uh, of the university. So from uh, working with um, a group who are looking at how health misinformation um, uh, it comes up and is propagated, um, groups building new resources to address vaccine hesitancy, uh, and so on and so forth. There's been some really, really amazing projects that have been funded. And of course, they're still going on. And some of the projects that we funded will go on until 2026 or 2027. So um, that brings me to this project, and um, Martin's going to tell us a little bit about that. It's, an ex it's a great example of citizen science, which I think is one of the most powerful ways of engaging the public, not just with the, the, the project itself and the outputs, but in the process of research about what it is to, to, to think about an experiment, what, what you have to do, the problems, the challenges, and it really is one of the best ways, I think, to encourage the public to think about science and its place in their lives and, importantly, how it's done. And that's very important for trust. So with no further ado, I'm going to pass on to Martin to tell you a little bit more about the genome detectives. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Alison. Oh. It's a bit weird when you're standing next to your own voice, which is uh, maybe my group won't agree with that. Maybe. And it, they hear a lot of me. Anyway, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. It's a great pleasure to see you. And welcome to this sort of iconic event. Um, so, uh, and the first thing I want to do is to thank everybody in my group, everybody in my group, for their involvement in this project, but especially to the team who's going to be taking tonight, and especially Fran, who's done a lot of the work for organising. So thank you very much, Fran. I know it's been a, a bit of a journey. And as we've seen, doing hybrid events has its own challenges and interests. Um, uh, but in the, the post-pandemic world, it's uh, sort of where, we, where we're at. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about PubMLST and about citizen science and science citizenship. Um, and actually, uh, I, so of course, what do I do in the model, modern urge, when you, modern era, you sort of Google. And interestingly, when I Googled it, the first thing I came up with was something on the Zooniverse platform, and which we're also very delighted to be involved in, we're talking about. Because the Zooniverse platform, this is a very Oxford thing. I mean, if you happen to be a member of the University of Oxford, and I'm sure many of you are, we have this wonderful free access to one of my favourite resources, with, which is the, um, the, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, which of course is a fantastic dictionary, fantastic resource in that sense. That's a fantastic way about learning about culture, actually, because of the way it works. And also an incredible sink of your time if you're not careful. But anyway, this Zooniverse press release about citizen science was the fact that the word citizen science had got into the Oxford English Dictionary. So what's better than starting recently to saying that the citizen science, it says noun, is scientific work undertaken by members of the general public, often in collaboration with or under the direction of professional scientists and scientific institutions. And here we are. Well, that's sort of true. But it's also, I was just saying to Alison, we first decided we'd have this because it's a wonderful venue, an iconic, you know, stand under the dinosaurs and everything. But of course, when we're talking about citizen science, this is especially important place and in public engagement in research because that, from the middle of the 19th century, this has been a center, not only for research and its results to be displayed as you see around, but much of the work that's gone on here was originally done by what you might call citizen scientists. And it started making me think about what citizen scientists really are and what a science citizenship means. So I'd like to elaborate just a few words on that, following on from what Alison said. Now, science, as many of you may know, is a new word itself. Hasn't been around for very long. Uh, first coined, I think, by William Weyhill, who was at Cambridge, an academic at Cambridge. Uh, before that, we thought of natural philosophy. Now, it's interesting, the word science and natural philosophy, then that was a change over. And of course, the original scientists were not actually professionals at all and science wasn't a profession so actually when we think about science science has its roots in citizens in fact it's historically something that has been done as a community activity by people you know because they're fascinated and interested in it so then i thought well i need to look up the oxford dictionary about what citizen science means and so, actually, there's two definitions, and this is sort of quite interesting. So, uh, you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, um, uh, citizen scientist. So, the first definition is a a scientist whose work is characterised by a sense of responsibility to serve the best interests of the wider community. Now, rare. 
Now, what I don't know is what's rare, is, is whether the use of the word is rare or whether the scientists serving the community is rare. But I think this is an important point. Science, of course, is an amoral activity. It's one that we look for the truth without fear or favor. But of course, it doesn't mean it's an immoral activity. And so the idea of the scientist not only as uh, a person who generates knowledge, but the scientist as somebody who's integrated in the community and believes and establishes themselves as a member of the community and contributing that community is really important. So then, let's look at number B, or second, is a member of the general public who engages in scientific work, often in collaboration with or under the direction of professional scientists and scientific institutions and amateur scientists. Well, so that's one definition of citizen scientists, and there's two, uh, uh, there's two definitions there, um, uh, the professional and the amateur. Now, I think we need to reflect today, we went through a period where Science was done almost entirely by amateurs. If you go, I used to take my undergraduates to Down House. Darwin was almost like the apotheosis of the amateur scientist. He, he was a man, fortunately, had his own income, and he set up Down House as his own institution, his own research institution. He uses the mail, and the, you, if you go around there, it's a, it's a home, it's his house, and he did all sorts of work in there. Then we moved through an area when science has become more and more professionalized and maybe less accessible. However, I think we're moving into a different phase now, and that's where we are. Now, who is a scientist and who is a layman? Now, here's a little story. My older daughter, Felicity, has recently started doing a PhD, and she's doing her PhD in um, plasma physics for fusion energy, a subject about which I know absolutely nothing. So who's the professional? In my case, I'm no longer the professional scientist. My daughter is the professional scientist, and I am the member of the general public. And really, so what, I'm, what we're trying to do here with these projects is really to start bridging the gap. All of us should be citizen scientists, and, and we can be citizen scientists in two different ways. We can be members of the general public who are interested, engaged in science, and isn't that an important thing to do? Because we, a lot of the decisions that we are faced with are all to do with scientific decisions, so we need to be engaging that information. But also, those of us who are scientists need to realize the limits of our expertise. And that's really what has happened more recently. N knowledge generation has grown so vast and so rapid that most of us are lay people about almost everything. So although I can stand up here and say, I'm an epidemiologist, I'm a scientist, I don't want to say, I'm a scientist, listen to me. Believe me, because I have authority of a scientist. In fact, I'm very famous, if uh, my students will tell you, I bore them in the fact I always say, don't believe what any authority figure ever tells you, especially not this one, because I know how unreliable this one is. Science is all about understanding, engaging with knowledge, and making the most of it yourself. And that's what we're really trying to do. And what we as, quote, professional scientists have to do is we have to take our bit of science and make it accessible so people can make their own mind up about decisions. And that's really important because if they want to, like, as we've seen in the last few years, sometimes we have to make decisions about information. And if we're given information that isn't clear or correct, it can really affect our ability to make decisions that actually affect our life in really important ways. So, where does our research fit in on this? Well, we run this program called PubM, this website called PubMST, and this is the, uh, a screenshot of the front page. This started off with a project that I started many years ago to catalogue genetic variation in bacteria. Um, many of you will know that sequencing has become a method of choice, DNA sequencing, for uh, decoding bacteria. But when I started doing sequencing, which is sort of in the sort of stone age of molecular biology back in the 1980s, this was done with equipment that we had to build in the lab. I was doing a talk for the unique students this morning, and they said, oh, what sort of sequencing methods do you use? And I said, we've got to do this, and we've got to do that, we need these factors. Nowadays, it's an industrial process. We don't even do sequencing in the lab ourselves. We subcontract it to a process that has it. When I started doing it, you literally did it with equipment you could have made in your garage. So that's another example of how this has become very professionalized and industrialized. But we now can create data at enormous amounts. So this is a screenshot. When did you take this screenshot, Fran? Was this 
This is this morning. So at the moment, our database has 681,517 genomes of bacteria in it. That's a lot of genomes. Each of those is a minimum of a mega a million base pairs in size, and many of them much bigger than that. It's got nearly a million bacterial isolates in, and you know, 30 million alleles. Now. When I started doing genetics, we would work on one organism, and indeed I managed to, my first paper, which I was very proud of, um, I studied one gene from an organism called E. coli, which many of you have heard about, and that was my entire PhD. People aren't very impressed about that, and then I tell them, well, I did get a nature paper out of it. Now, you know, that is nothing. It is a tiny amount. Now we produce vast amounts of data. And producing data is easy, but analyzing it is quite difficult. So when these projects came along, as Alison was saying, uh, we thought, well, we need to have a public engagement element of this work. Now, this database was always designed to engage with the, quote, professional scientific public, because we run well over 100, is it 120 different databases? About 130 different databases on here, and they're all run by colleagues from all over the world who do this as sort of public service. Because, of course, the other thing about us who are professional scientists is we're terrible geeks. We love what we do, and we want everybody to know about it. So there's lots of people running these databases themselves and, and doing what we call curating, find, checking that the information is accurate and checking that it is correct. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that there's a lot of data. And it's also not that accessible to the general public. And when the, um, when the, the public engagement award program came along, we thought, well, how can we leverage this to make it more accessible? And Adil, who's in the audience today, had done this very good uh, um, engagement thing called Genome Detectives, which was aimed largely at school children. And it was a manual which enabled them to work through the data. And so our first iteration of this went to the panel. And the panel said, mm, yeah, OK, but nah. Yeah, and quite rightly, because this was a process that we had and it was quite good. So we went back and we thought, well, yes, this does work. And then we scratched our head. And then we realized that we had, a, that we had two things to do here. It wasn't just a public engagement in the sense of telling people about what's there. We need help. We need you to quote a thing. We need help because there's a lot of this, although we can do a lot of the annotation describing what the genomes is automatically, there are many, many cases where the automated programs don't tell us the information we need. We need somebody to look at the data. And we thought, hey, we were talking about this in the group when we sat around and we brainstormed around it. We thought, yeah, what we could do is if we put sequences up, people could give us information about this. So this is uh, what the basis of the program. And I think, Fran, do you want to start moving on to the, uh, to the video next? We, 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 we put in place this genome detective's um, uh, uh, um, background. And, oh, <laughs> and <coughs> part of this program is to uh, <clears throat> part of this program is to give you scientific information, ask the general public to help us decode the information. And part of that, one of the things that Fran has done, is to work with Cyani to produce some information. So not only are we asking people to help him with this, but we are actually using uh, this platform as a way to tell people about bacterial genes and how they work. So we're going to have the first video now, and then after that, I think I'm going to hand over to Fran, who's going to talk a little bit about Campylobacter, and then we're going to have a Charlene, who will be talking about how this relates to meningitis. Uh, you're going to do an online demonstration, Holly, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So now let's have a look at the very first of the rather wonderful films that uh, uh, Fran has had made. Antibiotics and vaccines have both been incredibly powerful tools to help combat disease caused by pathogens like bacteria. But there are huge challenges that are already threatening our ability to tackle what were once easily treatable diseases. So how do we overcome these challenges? To understand this, let's take a closer look at bacteria. Not all bacteria are the same. There are a wide variety of different species while within a species, there can be different types. A bit like how a dog is a different species to a cat or horse, but can come in different breeds. Vaccines or antibiotics target precise parts of bacteria. This means that if those parts of the bacteria change, then the vaccines or antibiotics targeting these structures may not be as effective. We can look at changes in bacterial DNA to help us understand differences 
that might require us to change vaccines, or which will lead to resistance to antimicrobial drugs. DNA is a string containing four letters, A, T, G and C. Sections of DNA that code for specific proteins are called genes, while the full sequence of an organism's DNA is called its genome. Monitoring the population of disease-causing bacteria by sequencing their genomes and then picking the right vaccine or antibiotic is vital in ensuring that they continue to work most effectively. In recent years, DNA sequencing has become easier, which has led to a dramatic increase in the amount of data available to scientists. This information helps to make best use of existing interventions, as well as design new ones, which can be a long and painstaking process. So how can you help? We want you to become genome detectives and help us to decode these genes. PubMLST is a database that pulls information from DNA sequences from many different bacteria, collected by scientists from all around the globe. The database combines the genetic information, known as the genotype, with what it does, which we call the phenotype, and where it's from, which we call its provenance. The sequences are carefully organised and interpreted so that they're understandable and can be used to inform public health decisions. Using the Zooniverse website, you can contribute to the information used by scientists across the world to fight infectious diseases. Okay. <laughs> So, Sai and Annie are actually in the room today. So, thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Brilliant. So, I'm Fran. I'm going to give you a flavour of the sort of things that we do with the genes that have been characterised um, as part of the Genome Detectives project. So, I'm going to talk about Campylobacter, which um, in the top left of the slide you can see is a spiral shaped bacteria so it's well adapted to living in the guts of lots of different animals and you can also isolate it from the environment unfortunately in humans um, if we get it it causes very it can cause very severe food poisoning and a classic symptom is blood in stools um, occasionally it can cause some very nasty side effects so irritable bowel syndrome type um, I um, can't remember the name. <laughs> um, symptoms, that's it, sorry. Um, and I would say um, Guillain Barre syndrome, GBS, there, that's an autoimmune um, sort of temporary um, motor neurone paralysis, muscle weakness, so um, pretty nasty if you get it. Um, and also, you see, there's loads, um, five to 6,000 cases a year in the UK. So that sounds like a big number. It's a really big number. If we take all of the cases of people that are, put, are ill enough to go to the doctors and also people that are not quite ill enough to submit samples, if we average that over the year, that's one person becoming infected with Campylobacter every two minutes in the UK. It's huge. Um, now, we know from the genotyping studies that we do that 60 to 80% of human disease in high income countries, at least, is coming from contaminated chicken meat. And I'll show you a bit more about the um, genotyping studies in a minute. And also just note that if you cook chicken properly um, so that it's not pink in the middle, this bacteria is actually killed. But as we can see, lots of people don't manage to do this. Um, and also, it's a bit um, it's easy to sort of cross-contaminate utensils in the kitchen and so on. Um, but we also know that on farms, up to 75% of um, EU flocks have this bacteria. Now, I've called my talk The Curious Case of Campylobacter because there's lots of things we don't know about this bacteria. So one of them is we don't know whether it's supposed to be in the chicken guts or not. And then the other thing is, we know, or the billion dollar question, is that we know humans are getting a lot of their infection from chickens, but where do chickens get their Campylobacter from? So um, what we thought for a long time is that birds um, are a particular problem in that they have higher body temperature, which this bacteria likes to grow um, at, and so that they could um, share their Campylobacter. Or um, people think that it can be walked into chicken sheds on farmers' boots and things like that. 
Um, so, what I did for my PhD when we first started working out in this field was to test um, whether chickens do in fact have the same Campylobacter types as wild birds. So, this was on the university farm. You'll see that the chickens top left are free range, so they're the worst case scenario. They're mixing with wild birds. And we've chosen these two wild bird species which are starlings and geese because they're, they're on the farm in big numbers and we know that this um, Campylobacter is very genetically diverse. So we need to get lots and lots of samples. So for the starlings, I had more than a thousand samples. Um, but you can see from the graph there that um, chickens, they had all the yellow types of campies. Starlings had blue campies and geese have red campies. So we don't see any evidence of them swapping um, and being a source of infection for the chickens. So, um, actually we found, and this really amazed me when we first discovered this, the animal host is more important than geography. So you can see from this slide that the starlings have got the blue Campylobacters. They also have blue campies in Sweden, in America, and as, even as far away as New Zealand. Whereas the birds, wild birds on the same farm as the chickens, have completely different types. Um, so we've revised our previous thinking and actually we know that from the types of studies we're doing with the genome um, and genome detective types approach, we know from using that data and information that we're not, chickens are not becoming infected from these different animals and actually we think they're becoming infected with the chickens. If they've got chicken types, they're getting chicken campylobacters. Now the thing that um, a lot of people, I guess, are not familiar with is that the chicken industry is huge. I think there's 20 million of these um, meat chickens are slaughtered every week, and I always have to check that fact. Um, it's just massive and um, very complicated. So to be able to sort of tease this apart further, we have to do very um, lots and lots of the um, fine typing, um, which again, is the types of approaches that the Genome Detectives project is helping us with. So, to summarise the first part of this talk, um, I think knowledge is power. We really, really need to know a lot about bacteria um, to properly understand their biology and help us, if we want to stop the huge number of people becoming infected with Campylobacter, we really need to know the basic bio biology. We don't want to be focusing all our efforts um, in the wrong area. Um, so I'm going to move on now, um, in the interest of time, and talk a bit, little bit about antibiotic resistance. So Campylobacter is a perfect bacteria to work on for this. It's on the World Health Organization's watch list because it's really increased dramatically its level of antibiotic resistance over the years. And also, if you remember, this is a bacteria that infects both people and animals, and also wild animal species. And so um, there's a lot that we can learn from working with this bacteria. It's, it's very complicated and very difficult, but it's a good example organism to sort of see what's going on, um, because obviously there's thousands more bacterial species out there. So if we look at this top panel on here, um, we're looking at trends in antibiotic resistance in human isolates. Um, so they're collected over a 20-year period. So we're the only lab in the world that have got a continuous um, sort of study of human disease isolates, um, and we're able to monitor the changes in antibiotic resistance. So again, um, it sort of demonstrates how important it is to sort of have surveys and see the trends that are going on. So if we start on the top left, fluoroquinolones are a group of antibiotics. Um, they have started in 1997 to 8, there were sort of 5% resistance levels. Um, by the time we get to 2018, that's increased more than ninefold. So we're now at levels um, more than 45% resistance. And a similar story with the tetracycline. So we have 20% resistance early on, and that's now doubled. We're seeing more than 40% resistance strains. And then there's two more groups of antibiotics there. We've got aminoglycosides and macrolides. So at the moment, they look okay, but we're dealing with UK isolates here. That's not the story in other parts of the world. Um, some of these levels are really, really high um, elsewhere. And then in the bottom panel here, 
Um, this time we just have a snapshot in time of what's going on with um, meat samples. So we're talking about an organism that infects lots of different animals. It's a huge job to just sample everything all of the time. So we're, this time we've done a snapshot study. Um, so fluoroquinolones in the blue and tetracyclines in orange, two different classes of antibiotics. We can see they have very, very high levels of resistance in the chicken meat um, and less so in the other animal sources there. Um, in the red, the aminoglycosides, there's some resistance in the ducks and the cows, less so in the chicken, sheep and pigs. And the macrolides far right in grey, high levels of resistance, extremely high in ducks and pigs. So this sort of gives you a, a sort of impression of what's going on in veterinary treatment on farms and so on. But you also might be wondering why we're not seeing the aminoglycoside resistance coming through in the humans. And so humans at the top panel not matching the red in the bottom panel. I think that's a matter of exposure. So because we're eating so much chicken all the time, that's coming through and we're seeing that. Um, and less so with the duck and the cattle. And also, um, it's not nice to think about, but ducks and cows are slaughtered in a slightly different way to chickens. And the way chickens are slaughtered, it just sort of exacerbates the situation, really. Um, and then I'm just going to finish and show you the advanced version of genome detectors, which we haven't uh, set up yet. But when we've sort of characterised all the genes with your help, um, we can then go on to the next phase and look at the different variants. So here we have an example of a Campylobacter that's fluoroquinolone resistant. So it's small writing, I'm sorry about that, but hopefully you can pick out in the top panel there which one you think might be resistant. Um, so it's... Um, sort of a third of the way along, uh, highlighted in an arrow there, a black arrow. So the fourth one down has got a red T, whereas the rest have got blue Cs. It's changed at one nucleotide position. That's all it's taken for that isolate to become resistant to this antibiotic. And in the amino acid sequence, um, which is the middle panel there, um, that single point mutation at the nucleotide has caused an amino acid change, which is what's making the antibiotic not effective anymore. Um, and then at the bottom is just the code table to tell you that that's how I know which an amino acid has changed. So that's one example. <clears throat> There's actually other examples um, where these mutations may occur. So we like to sort of track these and work out what's going on and how this resistance is spreading. And then you'll see there's efflux pumps on there as well. That's because bac this bacteria lives in the gut. It's a hostile environment and it needs to extract things like bile salts. But unfortunately for us, the side effect of that is it's also very effective at extracting antibiotics. So we're also looking for things like efflux pumps as well as um, changes in the nucleotide sequence. And then, <clears throat> so this, I just wanted to explain how selection of resistance happens. So we start at the fluoroquinolone resistance panel at the top there. There's a mix of highly resistant bacteria, so they are not going to be killed by fluoroquinolone. They're shown in red. And there's lots of blue circles there that are sensitive and they would be killed by the antibiotic. So where it says selection, that's where we've, um, say if this is an infected animal, we've given them the fluoroquinolone. The blue circles, bacteria are killed, but the red ones persist. Um, and then they grow in number. Now with fluoroquinolone, we know that if we remove that antibiotic, so it's no longer causing that selection pressure, um, this bacteria is quite happy, actually. It continues to grow. Although it's done that single point mutation, it hasn't affected it at all. And there's some evidence that it even grows better with the resistance gene than when it's sensitive. But you'll see that's different to the macrolide resistant um, panel at the bottom. And if you remember, that's the one in the UK where we've got very low levels of um, resistance. So I think in the UK it's gone up and then it's actually come down again when we've removed that antibiotic. So what's happened here, it has a stepwise, more complicated way of becoming resistant to antibiotics. So that when we um, remove the antibiotic pressure, 
when it's got its um, new way of becoming resistant, that means it can't compete with the ones that are sensitive if we remove the antibiotic. Um, and so they sort of go away again on the right-hand side. You can see that the blue sensitive ones have come back. Um, so we have different situations here with different antibiotics. And again, this is why we're doing so much work looking at different variants and different bacteria and understanding the bigger picture. Um, I don't want to be too depressing, but this is why we're here, is that we really want to sort of galvanise action um, into sort of solving things like antibiotic resistance. And Charlene's going to also talk about uh, vaccines, so preventative measures. But really, um, I'm sort of quoting from the World Health Organization here, um, antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest threats to the global health, food security and development today. I mean, we've, if um, antibiotic resistance continues at such high rates, we're sort of looking at a picture of returning back to the 18th century where some of these um, bacteria, and you can look at the pictures in the um, sort of activities if you're here in person, um, we see sort of returns of bacteria and diseases that we haven't heard of for hundreds of years even. Um, and then the other thing with antibiotic resistance, it can affect anybody at any age in any country. Um, and then as I've hopefully dem demonstrated on the previous slide, some antibiotic resistance is already occurring naturally within these bacteria. But if we misuse antibiotics, we risk selecting for the resistance ones. So we have to really be careful with what we're doing. And again, all this information is it feeding into us being able to do this. And so the characterizing of the bacterial gene variants is allowing us to make the best use of the antibiotics we've already got um, and hopefully identify new ones. But the new ones is an extremely long process. We're looking years and years down the line. So we really, all of this work is helping us um, to try and avoid big disaster. And I'm just going to finish by saying, um, sort of echoing what Martin said, this is a group um, sort of collective um, bit of work that I've shown. So we, we collaborate with people um, in, across many different countries. And of course, we're really grateful for people that supply the samples to us. So people work in the microbiology labs and then the farmers giving us samples. And of course, all the funding bodies that have allowed us um, or enabled us to do all of the work. Yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> I'll hand over to Charlene now. Thank you very much, Fran. Good evening and welcome. And thank you for everyone joining online and everyone joining us here in person. So, where's my clicker? So I am Charlene. I am, um, as well as being a scientist that studies genomes with these wonderful people, I am also a paediatrician who specializes in infectious diseases. So I bring uh, my clinical hat to everything I do and that includes Zooniverse. So I'm sure, and I hope everyone here agrees that vaccines are one of the foremost public health initiatives that over the last century, making us all lead longer and, health, longer and healthier and happier lives. You can see here the burden of disease that's fallen from the, in, from the implementation of vaccines with the blue circles being the, the burden of disease and the brown when the vaccine was implemented and some of the most dramatic impacts being measles, the, the biggest circles on the left um, and the rapid and, you know, dramatic changes in life expectancy following those implementations. And there are different types of vaccines. They come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. So we can have vaccines that are whole bugs, whole bacteria that have either been weakened um, or killed completely. And that's injected into us and we mount an immune response to those um, whole, whole cells. Or we can take uh, things that are extruded from the bacteria, such as toxins, and make those into vaccines so our body recognises those. We can alternatively use different parts, like things on the outside of bacteria, such as um, individual proteins or sugar coats that many bacteria have to protect them when they're inside our body. Um, I'm sure many people here in the room will have had the newest of vaccine technologies on the bottom, which is the mRNA vaccines for COVID. So small bits of genetic material surrounded by a bit of uh, fat tissue to help it circulate in our body. So there are many different vaccines. And they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And as Fran said, along with, vac with antibiotics, these vaccines take a huge amount of time to develop and implement. And now following COVID, hopefully much less time, but still a lot of thought um, and understanding about how these bugs cause infection. 
And these are just some of the pathogens that we deal with in our patients of all ages. And half of these here, so diphtheria, meningococcus and pertussis, have all got well-established vaccines. The diphtheria vaccine is one of those um, toxin vaccines where we take the, the toxin that diphtheria exudes out of itself to try and well, well, the bit that makes us sick, and that's the bit that is used in the vaccine to protect us. And hence, we very, very, very rarely see diphtheria in countries that have vaccines with high vaccine uptake. Pertussis has two different types of vaccine. It has a whole cell one, like we described, but killed, so it doesn't really um, make you too unwell. It gives you the, the pretend that, you're, that you've been infected with that bacteria. And it also has a vaccine where you take those bits around the outside, some protein subunits, to help you mount an immune response, and these have different effectiveness. Meningococcus is a bacteria we'll talk about a bit later on, but this has two types of vaccine. One that's the sugar coating around the edge, um, of which there are different types, and a different vaccine that uses the proteins around the outside of the bacteria. And we'll talk about that one in much more detail and how genomics can help us um, understand this better. But group B strep, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and TB are still big, big problems in infectious disease, cause a huge amount of disease, morbidity, and mortality worldwide. Um, Klebsiella pneumoniae is particularly problematic as um, an antimicrobial uh, resistant pathogen. So um, Fran talked to you about these bugs that the WHO are very concerned about. Klebsiella pneumoniae is on the critical pathogen list. It's, cause, it's a big problem with resistance, people getting infections that we've got no drugs left to treat. And vaccines can be key to trying to prevent those infections in the first place, at which point you don't need antibiotics to treat you because you're, you, you haven't acquired an infection. So trying to take away that burden of antibiotic use by preventing infections in the first place is another good reason to make vaccines. TB, we all know how big an issue TB is globally of children, people of all ages, from the youngest children to the eldest people. So these are big problems, but we don't have vaccines for group B strep, TB and Club pneumonia yet. We're still thinking about how we can best understand how these bacteria cause disease and which bits of the, vaccine, which bits of the bug to target to make good effective vaccines. And so thinking a bit about that, this is an example thinking about that sugar capsule on the outside of many bacteria which you can see at the bottom in the black and white schematic picture. This is just a coat around the outside. And if you zoom in with the magnifying glass, you can see it's made of lots of different colors of chains, the red, the blue, the orange, and the uh, green. And these are just different sugars that give it a different structure. But you can see, if you look at the top, that a single gene, uh, section of genes will encode which structure is made. So the very top is one example of the gene where you've got bits on the end that are the same, and then the bit in the middle that is different, which is multicolored. So you've got the green, the blue, the orange, and the yellow. And that makes this chain of green, blue, orange, and yellow um, monomer A. But the same gene combination can be slightly different as the one underneath, B, where you've got green, pink, and yellow. And suddenly that gives you a whole different structure of sugars, as you see in monomer B. And that simple gene change in gene combination, or maybe gene structure, can give you a change in what you see. And we call the top one genotype because that's the genetic code. And we call the bottom one phenotype because that's what we see. That's what we observe is a different sugar chain. And that's all well and good. But when it comes to vaccines, that's really important. And that's really important because of what we've got on the left-hand side of this, uh, right-hand side to you of this figure. So we talk about these, uh, this Y-shaped structure is an antibody. And now we're all a bit more familiar with these terms post-COVID, we all kind of understand what, these, what our body's doing when we're vaccinated, you're making antibodies a lot of the time to try and help your body remember when you see this bug again next time, these antibodies are made and you respond better, or your immune response better, and therefore you never get infected the next time around when you see this. And this is how vaccines work. So those different sugar structures are kind of shown here in the different colors. So if the first sugar you make is that yellow, yellow one that's binding, the antigen that's binding to the Y shape, that's good. If you see something with that yellow shape again in the future, that's good, you'll be protected. But if you have that different sugar chain, and it's actually now the purple one, or the red one, or the green one, with a different shape, it doesn't bind so well to the antibody you made last time. And so it doesn't work so well, potentially. And again, we see this now in in day-to-day -day discussions on the news with COVID vaccines, don't work so well against Delta, don't work so well against Omicron, all because of this very same example. Antibodies are very specific, and what they're made to, we need to, and if we can understand what the differences are and things that they're being exposed to, we can make better choices of vaccines. 
So an example here is the meningococcus, which is this bug up here that causes septicemia, causes meningitis, it can cause some severe illnesses and has a high mortality rate in places where vaccines are not used widely. And this is the outside of the bacteria, if you look more closely. It's got sugar around the outside. It's got all these little things, which is the, it's got lots of things flying off it, including lots of proteins, which are things shown in different colours. And these proteins are what we can study using genomics. I think we've seen the database already. So this is where we, we go to do these, these, things, these studies. This is how we can start defining how these proteins are different from the genotypes, from the genes that are encoding these proteins. So I just took this snapshot of an example of, of an overview of a genome. It's hard to imagine a genome. It's hard to imagine exactly what it looks like. But it's lots, a big, big, big long string of C's, G's, A's and T's. But if you zoom, zoom, zoom out, which is essentially what this has done, and you look at this purple panel along the bottom, every line is a gene. So this just shows you all the genes across the, the genome of the meningococcus. And then they're categorized in different ways. And we're just going to look at one of these genes. So if you look here at the top sequence, that is the protein sequence of one of those proteins, FHPP, on the outside of that meningococcus. So the CSS, GG, GVA is the, the amino acid sequence that makes the protein. And I've got two sequences here, number one and number 545, completely random numbers. But we've compared the two here. And where you can see 545, there's dots along most of it, like you can see. And that's because they match. They're exactly the same. So sequence one and sequence 545 are exactly the same all the way along, except where I've highlighted them in red or orange, at section 70, near section 70. So they are almost identical. So if your antibody were to see number one or number 545, they might recognize them because they're probably very similar in shape. But compare, contrast that with this one. If you've got number one and number 47, again, another random pick. But the bacteria you get infected with could be number 545 or 47. And depending on what vaccines you've had, the chances of it being a really good match or not a very good match are kind of random. So this is what we've been doing, trying to understand and develop methods by which we can try and understand this better and make this useful for people like me in hospitals, in public health, who have to make decisions about what to give you, the public, as vaccines. So we want to try and understand genotype, as we said, the genetic code, to try and understand how it relates to phenotype, so what those proteins look like on the outside of the bacteria. And when we do understand what they look like, trying to infer how likely we think the vaccine will be effective. So we've taken the genetic data from PubMLST for this um, initiative called Mendevar, and we've looked at all these different protein uh, gene sequences and protein structures, and we've compared them to some work in the lab where people have been painstakingly taking different bacteria, testing them, seeing if they can be killed in different like, lab experiments, and putting this data together, and working out which gene sequences are likely to be protected or not protected by the vaccines that we have. And this is our current workflow. This is what we do currently in, the Scot in Scotland, in uh, Public Health Scotland, working and collaborating again, as Fran said, with many different people, um, but our public health and microbiology colleagues in Scotland. We can take a blood culture from a patient in any hospital in Scotland. They all get sent to Glasgow. We can sequence the bacteria, which happens in real time within two days of them receiving that culture. We can get the DNA sequence. We can put it through public MLST database. And we can get a readout of whether we think this bacteria is likely to be prevented by one vaccine or another, because there are two vaccines at the moment that are, in, that are licensed. And we can get a very simple readout, an amber tra uh, green, amber, red traffic light system that helps people who don't know a lot about genomics, who aren't specialist scientists, as we talk about in genetic science, but can start using this information. And again, knowledge is power, if we can take that information and actually enact it in what we do day to day, then this becomes all much more useful. So this is where Genome Detectives is hopefully going to play into this whole system. Uh, we need more people to type more of those genes, all those uh, lines of genes 1, 4, 5, 5, 4, 5, 47, those are ones that have been characterized already, but they are continuously coming in. And if we haven't characterized them, then we can't easily make these decisions on what to do with them. So you will see, and if you've already had a go at practicing or practiced online, you will see how our, um, our project works. 
you can go into classify and you will see a gene sequence, so the subject. And this gene sequence is pulled straight out of the database by Keith, our bioinformatician, and it's exactly what we see. It's exactly what we work on. So you're not getting anything different or anything you know, that's been processed. This is what we see. So you're helping us to start the process of annotating these genes, curating this information, so that when we get it back from you, we can quickly classify it and put it into the database so people can then use this information, scientists, doctors, public health people, to actually inform what they do. So you can have a go and practice, and we hope um, you'll have a go at that later on. But by doing this, by helping us classify these, these genes, by identifying new variants, you are feeding directly into the information that's in the PubMed LSU database. You are helping us to find more genes, more variants. And by doing that, you're actually then helping us to identify which vaccines to give, which drugs, um, you know, AMR drug, uh, bacteria are likely to be resistant to, bacteria, to, to antibiotics. So you're directly helping us to do this work and also helping uh, to translate this work and implement this work in the real world. So we hope you, uh, we thank you for coming. We hope you have a go and enjoy some of the activities and we hope you have a go on Genome Detectives and help us to categorize some of this data um, to help us all. Thank you. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, I'm Holly Bratcher. I'm one of the researchers that has been helping to develop this project. So we've heard from Fran, whose background is in microbiology, Charlene, who is a pediatrician, and I myself have a background in genetics and forensic DNA identification. So we have a very multi-functional group that has uh, put together the different components of this project. and. I think I have one of the more fun jobs this evening. I'm going to do a live demonstration for you, especially for those of you who maybe haven't had a chance to look at the program itself yet. <clears throat> so first thing I'm going to do, um, this is another video that we have um, had help with from Cy Andy. So I'm just going to run this. This is also on our uh, Genomes Detective Wedge page under the tutorial. So let me just set that off running, and then we will go through the project. Enormous quantities of genomic data are produced by scientists every day. We need your help to decode these genes. Here's how to become a genome detective by using the Zooniverse website. You will be given a DNA sequence consisting of the bases A, T, G and C. The section representing the gene will be highlighted. Genes are sections of DNA that code for proteins. Proteins are made up of a chain of amino acids. Bases are arranged in groups of three, called codons. The bases within a codon determine which amino acid it makes. Genes begin with a start codon and end with a stop codon. Your first task will be to find these within the DNA sequence. Usually, the start codon will be at the beginning of the highlighted gene, and the stop codon will be at the end. However, if there are changes in the specific sequence you're analysing, they may be elsewhere, and you'll have to hunt for them up and downstream. Each DNA sequence can encode three different amino acid sequences. You'll have to determine which of these reading frames the gene is in by lining up your start codon with its associated amino acid. Finally, you will also need to identify misplaced stop codons that may appear in the middle of the gene. You only need to report them if they're in the same frame as the gene. All this information will be used by scientists to detect differences in bacterial DNA sequences. This is essential to help them to understand infectious diseases and how they can be prevented or treated. Okay, so that just gives you a little bit of a snapshot of what the project involves. What I'm going to go do now is give you an actual run through of the project, especially for those of you who maybe haven't had a chance to actually go through uh, the project on the Zooniverse web page. And I just need to. There we go. So, what I've done here is. Oh, and it's missing. Do 
Do I need to reshare? Oops, sorry, my mistake. <laughs> So while he's getting uh, sorting that out for me, what I've done is I've just preloaded the Zooniverse web page that you will see when you log on to the project. And I've pulled up one of our first tasks. So when you log on to the website itself and you click on classify, you'll get a picture of the gene here. And one of the things that we need your help with most when we are looking at any given genome to try and identify the different genes, we have a system that automatically identifies probably around 97% of the genes that are in any given genome. It's the small bits and pieces that we need your help with that can be quite confusing for algorithms to figure out at this point. So the project actually has another component to it that we touch on a little bit if you read the information, um, additional information in the project, and that is developing AI algorithms that are going to help us identify these sequences in the future much, much easier. And the problem with some of these sequences is, is it miss, it's missing information. Our databases are designed to use what is called a BLAST algorithm. And an algorithm just looks at a sequence of DNA and says, do I have a match for this anywhere? We kind of do this blunt force approach to identifying the sequences because we know that these sequences can be very variable. But our algorithms can't quite identify all of that just yet. So if we take a look at the sequence that's shown here, the very top line, you see there's the blue-green box there that highlights the ATG, which is a start codon. The yellow is our gene that's been identified. But if you look towards the end, we don't have a stop codon highlighted, so we don't have a red box there. So we need to try and figure out where that stop codon has gone. So we have a series of questions that will lead you through to answer these questions. And I just make sure my mouse is over there. So in looking at this one, does the gene sequence begin with a star code? On this one's pretty easy. It's highlighted. It's right there. So that's all good on that one. This then leads on to a second question, which is the reading frame, which we've identified. You can see there on the uh, right-hand side of the sequence, F1, F2, F3. So that's just frame one, frame two, and frame three. Now, if you look at our start code on there and you look at the protein sequence or the amino acid sequence just above it, you see the ATG is encoded by an M, which is methionine. So that's a start codon or an amino acid that just about every gene starts with in bacteria, but not quite every single one of them. But most of the time, that's what we're going to find. And that methionine, if we read across to the frames, is in frame three. Okay? So if we look at the amino acid sequence for frame three and just read all the way through looking at that sequence, we're not seeing any of these stop codons in frame three until we get to this last line, okay? So what that tells us is something's gone a little screwy with this gene, but we're not entirely sure what, and it appears that that stop codon has probably either been moved or it's been mutated somehow. So we have to try and figure out where that mutation or that change has occurred. Generally speaking, when we start to see internal stop codons in a gene, it's usually an indel, and that's just a shortened word for insertion or deletion. And we know that, for the most part, because we start to see these internal stop codons. You generally don't see this many mutations in bacteria in a single gene. So if we look at where these stop codons fall, we can see that they're not entirely consistent. However, if we look all the way to the end here, we actually do have a stop codon that ends that gene, but it's in a different frame. So we know a stop codon exists for this gene, but we have to re-identify it. We have to teach the database where that stop codon is when it has this kind of ambiguous read to it. So for this task, which reading frame is it in? And in this case, we are in frame three and that's consistent with our information. Does the gene sequence end with a stop in the highlighted in red? So this might be a little bit of a tricky question. It does end with a stop codon, but it's not highlighted in red because it's in a different frame. Does that make sense to everyone? But we do see there is a stop codon there. So 
we're asking people to tell us exactly what they're seeing in this image here, which is, does the gene sequence end with a stop codon highlighted in red? It does not, because this, the program itself has not been able to identify that because it's in a different frame, because it's reading in frame three and it doesn't show up in frame three. So we want to then go back to our start codon and we want to identify Sorry, I kind of jumped ahead of myself there a little bit in my explanation, um, where the stop codon is. And we've already identified that. It actually is in frame one. So again, this is how we know that these genes have some, or this particular gene has somehow been altered uh, within this particular organism. So can we identify the frame um, 50 bases up or downstream? And of course we can, because it's right at the end of it. So we can say, yes, we can identify it. Apologize, it's not on my screen in front of me, so I'm just kind of having to read at an angle here. Uh, look for the stop codon in the reading frame that we are in, and we did identify the codons that are in, excuse me, we did identify stop codons that are in the reading frame that we want that really shouldn't be there. Um, so this one is, yes, we do have stop codons. Now, what this information is doing for us, like I said, it, it's kind of twofold. One is we're hoping to gather enough information so that we can develop some AI programs downstream. That's way downstream at this point because we've just started the project. But what this does for us, it does for myself, for Charlene, for Fran, is it takes that information and it takes that sequence and puts it into a bin. And these bins are pre-labeled. So this bin, when I come to look at all of the characterizations that you've done for us, I know right away everything in this bin has a start codon. It has a stop codon, but it's not been identified because it's in the wrong frame. So when I go in to characterize these, I know exactly what I'm looking for. When I have to um, characterize these on my own, it can sometimes take hours to do a single gene because there's so many variations we have to go through. So this is really where we want to leverage citizen science in the Zooniverse platform. The more people we have looking at these sequences, the more eyes we have on these, picking these things out, we can slowly develop a pattern system for recognition of these things. So then we just pop that into its bin and it takes us on to the next image that we're going to look at. I'm not going to go through another one, but one of the things I did want to point out is we've had the program up and running now for about a week, I think it is. Is that right? And we've come across a couple of uh, really good questions that have come in about the way we've set up the logic for this. And I think it's really important. Um, we've learned some really good lessons from those of you that have participated already. Some of the wording that we've used in here, although to the scientists and the geneticists and the people who actually look at this on a day-to-day -day basis, we thought some of our questions and our choices were very clear. Many of you have pointed out to us that maybe it wasn't quite so clear. Um, so this has been a really good learning experience for us because in order for us to interact with the public, get them to understand what we're trying to ask them to help with, we need to make sure we understand what you understand. So that's where we're going with this. We are going to be here for a little bit longer. Ah, yes. Thank you for the reminder. I almost forgot to tell you something. Yeah, so we also have this tutorial here. We have tutorial there and then also we have what we call a field guide. So both of these are some of the resources that I mentioned earlier. Um, if you have questions, but we also have a question board that actually comes up um, that you can actually field us questions and we are online most days to answer your questions and that's under this talk tab here. You can ask all different types of questions, post interesting things you find and whatnot. So please make sure that as you're doing these, if you have questions, if you notice anything, let us know because it's helping us learn what information you need to help you so you can help us. Thank you.
Okay, so I think I'm the last speaker, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Okay, so we do have a few minutes left, but we are going to have to wrap up for this evening. If you have any questions, we are here for about another 15 minutes or so. And also, anyone online, if you have questions, please do post them to the chat section. We will answer all of them when we get the moment. Probably, maybe not tonight, all of them. Um, we've got quite a few of them, I guess, coming in. But we will answer all of your questions, either online or via the platform. So thank you very much. We have a comment board at the back as well. If you'd like to leave any comments or questions, please do use that as well. Thank you. everyone I just wanted to, one final thing Charlene how many people have we had so far on the platform we've had at least 500 who have done about 7,000 image classifications so we got through our first set of data last night in the middle of the night which we didn't know about because we were asleep um, and people asking I can't get the data to work but this morning we found helpfully uploaded some more so we have our next set of data so it's churning through so we hope it's going to be a continuous process that we keep uploading, because the data is not going away. Yeah, brilliant. And there's going to be lots more to come. So thank Great. you. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah. What if someone misreads the data and provides you with wrong? Ah, oh, that's a great question, actually. I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. That's that why. Might maybe repeat the question. Yeah. yeah. So the question was, for those of you online, what happens if a user misclassifies something? The way that we've set up the logic binning on this, it will flag something that doesn't make sense. But even if it doesn't flag it as something maybe that isn't quite right, those of us that are curators are looking at all of this data as well. And if we find something that is misclassified, um, we will look at how, it, how and why it got misclassified. And if it's a matter of tweaking wording or making something more clear, we can do that. Sometimes, though, you just misclassify yeah. things. But we do try and check all of it. And 90% uh, of the time, I would say, we can sort it out. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, um, though. It's also the power of the Zooniverse, though. The power yeah. of the Zooniverse is in the sheer numbers of people that do these things. And yes, we all, we're always coming to something first. So maybe it's the first one you do and you get it a bit wrong because you weren't quite familiar with it or you just misread it and couldn't see the screen properly. But actually, those things are rare. What pe People going through them over and over and over get, very, get good at doing things. And actually, the consensus of what we find, and Holly found this with the beta testing, is that generally people got the same in agreement with what we would have done. So the power of the Zooniverse, I think, is just in the sheer numbers of people involved. And that's why we really want people to be getting involved globally. And you can be anywhere. You can tell your friends, relatives, cousins all over the world about this, because all you need is a computer and the internet. Yeah. And I, that's all you need to be that's able right. to That's right. In fact, it goes back to Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, who discovered this resource called the Pat Wisdom of the Crowds. There used to be a competition at fairs, guess the weight of the cow. And, if you want. and he, he found that uh, when he did a study of this, that actually, if you did the average of everybody's analysis, the, the average was exactly right. In fact, they got to the say that it was so good that people didn't bother weighing the cow because there was no need. And the person who got closest to the average. So the real power of this is you're not the only person doing this. Don't worry. Lots of other people do it. And on average, you'll get it right. So there's no competition for being the best here. doesn't matter. What we need is lots of people. And it's the power, it's, that's the really thing about being citizen science. It's the power of numbers. This is a collective endeavor, and we get it right by working together, not by being individual heroes. Okay, thank you all very much, and I think we've got a little bit longer for the event. Yeah. <laughs>